you could what's to stop anyone who wants to score movies going out with their iPhone shooting a, a five minute short and and scoring it themselves for what you know a few thousand dollars you've got a system which is ten times more powerful than anything I had when I was doing TV in the, in the 90s right right and putting it on YouTube sharing it with friends if it's good I do believe people stop, will take notice Behind every amazing soundtrack, amazing video game soundtrack or film soundtrack, there are people who, talented artists and individuals who are helping create this amazing piece of art that maybe hang out behind the scenes and don't necessarily have their name you know, on the first title card of the credits. But these are individuals who, without them, the, the music... Uh, or the film would just not be the same. And that's why I want to talk about this guy named Gavin Greenaway. I was doing a live stream one day and I started listening to this piano song and it just brought me to, uh, almost brought me to tears on the live stream, but you know, I, I cried later, but not on the live stream. Uh, and this guy's name is Gavin Greenaway and he is an incredible pianist and he has pretty much had his fingerprints all over the music side of the film industry and the video game industry. Um, you know, whether it's uh, Face Off or The Peacemaker or Ants or The Prince of Egypt or The Thin Red Line, uh, Gladiator, Chicken Run, Hannibal, Shrek, all the way down to Iron Man, The Dark Knight, Sherlock Holmes. I mean, I'm getting chills looking at all, looking at all these amazing uh, movies that he has worked with um, on his Wikipedia page. And he is the conductor of all of these amazing soundtracks. And he actually goes on tour with Hans Zimmer, uh, often, uh, and conducts the orchestra for Hans Zimmer's music. He's also done some incredible, um, soundtracks for video games and that includes Marvel's Spider-Man last year in 2018 and also um, the Final Fantasy series that came out last year. In short, Gavin's had an incredible career but my favorite part, my favorite part of Gavin is you can just sense he has he has a pure heart um, and an incredible kindness and well thought out wisdom. Um, so I, I strongly suggest you listen to the entire interview because I definitely learned a lot from this guy. Um, and I think we're, we're really lucky to be able to hear what he has to say. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. All right. Well, we're live. Um, not live, but we're recording now. So um, Gavin, I really appreciate you being willing to, to talk with me. Um, I know you're in, are you in, you're in England, right? Or London? I'm in England. I'm about 20 miles south of London. 20 miles south of London. So it's, it's probably getting late for you. And so I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, to talk to me about your uh, incredible career like you've done so many things um, that I, I could only dream of and you've you've worked with I think probably every famous composer there is um, <laughs> it's just incredible so would you like to just introduce yourself and what you've done in yeah. your career and and all that good stuff Sure. So I'm Gavin Greenaway. And uh, as Thomas said, I, I, I kind of tried everything in the business uh, I, from uh, being to an assistant engineer to a uh, producer to writing music to movies, uh, writing music for adverts, orchestrating for people, conducting for composers, uh, conducting live concerts, uh, writing my own piano music and performing that. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've worked with um, people like Hans Zimmer. James Newton Howard, uh, Ramin Javadi, um, Lord Balfe, you know, lots of the film guys. Um, also been very lucky to to work um, conducting for people like Paul McCartney, which is was <laughs> was quite a hoot. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's insane. And to George Martin. In fact, uh, the first time I conducted an orchestra was for George Martin, and uh, that was quite an experience. Man, dude. Um... Wow, I guess that's the end of the interview. That's all we need to. Yeah. Know. <laughs> that's all we need to know. That's really, really incredible. So I've got like a billion questions here. Um, so the reason, the reason why you're so important to me, like I, this isn't an exaggeration. I think about 
your most recent album probably every day to every other day. I, I something about that album is really really special to me, um, and it's your most recent release. Um, it doesn't mean you're not you're obviously still doing plenty of orchestration work. So I kind of want to just maybe backtrack from that album yeah. and sort yeah. of because because it's weird to me because you worked with Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard and all these like um, big composers that have really big um, adventurous and sometimes explosive sounds mm. but your most recent album is really delicate so i just want to know kind of is your heart more of a delicate heart and you're willing to compose for these big composers or you're willing to orchestrate what it would conduct for these uh for these composers you're just willing to do it because it's fun but your heart yeah. is really in a delicate place like i'm trying to figure it, out what that is yeah well i think it will stem some um Five years ago, I, I was um, just just over five years ago. I was rapidly approaching fifty, which uh, I know is a long way in the future for you, but yeah. um, for me, it sort of suddenly hit me that for the previous twenty five years, I hadn't made any music that someone hadn't paid me to do. Right. It right. was like a, kind of a job. Although I love music, I love all aspects of it, and uh, I, I, I've had a great time uh, doing the music. I, I, I've uh, written some of it has been quite big um i don't know if you know the the epcot uh theme park in yes oh. it's me and my wife's favorite right. place on earth so, is epcot. so you'll know that I've, I've got the show uh, reflections yes. of earth which in fact finishes its run uh in uh september after 20 years it's they're and gonna quite... they're gonna end it the what's it the parade of nations or tapestry yeah. Tapestry of, uh, no, the Tapestry of Nations was the um, the parade, which only ran for about three years because the uh, the weather was was very hostile towards the the, uh, right. the puppets and the costumes. Right. The, the fireworks sh show was um, run for twenty years, and it's time for a new a new piece. That's fine, but it's quite big and bombastic. Yeah, uh, and as you say, that the music of Hans uh, and and Lorne is is very big and muscular music. Yes, and so at this point, about five years ago, I thought, well. I don't really want to compete with that. And I want to do something that would <laughs> be personal that only I could do. Yes. And that took me back to playing the piano, which was my first instrument. You know, I've played it since, since I was six. Mm -hmm. And I um, and I hadn't really played for 20-some years. Uh, and I was really rusty. Uh, but I, I wrote about... 14 and 15 pieces and having written them for myself to, to enjoy playing, I thought, well, I, I ought to record these, these yeah. things. So I then spent a number of weeks playing not to my satisfaction really. And then I spent uh, a fair amount of time editing, um, which is sort of where I, I think saved it as a, as a, as a, as a thing. Um, having edited it, I thought I'll play it to a few people, and, and I got a positive response, so I, I, I put it out as an album, and, and yeah. I got a very positive response. But then work takes over, and there's, uh, you know, I've been doing, touring with uh, the world of Hans Zimmer the you know, last year or so, yes. on a, which is fantastic fun. I mean, conducting an orchestra of 70, 80 people, 10,000 people are in a crowd. It, yeah, it, I was going to say, it, those have got to be some really big crowds. It's really fun and it's great <laughs> music and it always goes down well. But like you say, it's, it's big stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so I think my recent album, Woven, is sort of a reaction in a way to, to that. Um, yeah. And I've got even quieter, more intimate, um, all about how much you can eke out of one sound. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. You, uh, you work with 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 uh, sequencers and samplers, and you know they're fantastic for yeah. what they can do. But after years of sitting behind a computer, I was just really ready to work with something completely. Well, I wasn't sure, Gavin, if you did work like work with a computer, like because you're you're a conductor, and then the, your albums that you release are very natural sounding, like everything is organic. So. But then I found out that composers like, um, what's his name, Danny Elfman, I mean, uh -huh. even he is using um, samples and synthesizers. Yeah. And so is that an industry standard at this point? Certainly. For, for mock-ups and, and your directors expect to hear uh, something that is pretty close to the, the final thing. Okay. Uh, but doesn't obviously have the, 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 
the musicians on it and, the, and that sort of uh, emotion and the, yeah. and the polish that you get from yeah um, and there's probably only a few composers left in the world that can get away with just playing it on the piano to the director yes you know, uh, John Williams would be one of those um, <laughs> Most of the demos that I hear of, of composers, um, for instance, John Powell, um, I did a little bit of uh, orchestration for him on right. um, the How to Train Your Dragons films. Wow. And you, know, you listen to the, the demos and you go, wow, it's, it sounds finished. Wow. It's all there. Yeah. So why do they why do they fork out like it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, right, to oh, record absolutely. it live? Yeah, um, the, millions. So why do they do that? If if most the average person, even me, even though I, I do record music a lot, I yeah. probably wouldn't be able to tell. So why do they do that? You wouldn't be able to tell necessarily immediately, uh, and I think it's it's a it's a kind of a feel thing. Yeah, you just especially in the cinema when you're on the the big speakers, yeah. they reveal all those sort of subtleties. Even with a, a crash bang wallop film, you know, like a, an action film. And there's something about the breadth of real strings and brass that you just, luckily, you just can't sit <laughs> Yeah, um, otherwise all of your uh, musicians would be out of a job. We would be out of a job, yeah. <laughs> so, um, man, there's so many questions. So what's the pressure like? Because cause you've, you've conducted for, um, it wasn't John Williams, but it was uh, Solo, right? The Star Wars yeah, movie? Yeah, Solo, which... Um, John had John Powell wrote the um, majority of the music for that, but John Williams had written some themes as well. So, uh, okay. So was that was that nerve wracking to to jump into something as massive as a Star Wars film? Um, was that nerve wracking for you? No, you no. Know, it's always a kick when you work with you know on a, a franchise that you've seen since you were pretty young and yeah, and, and Were you a fan? And, Absolutely. <laughs> um, first Star Wars film is one of my top ten films. Wow. Um, uh, it's just, it's brilliant. It's, it's got everything. Uh, and it's got the myth, which is, you know, obviously, which has now become a big um, part of, of, of films, you know, the, the sort of the mythical uh, worlds and, yes. and the, the, the hero's journey and, and all of that. Uh, but co- coming back to the pressure thing, I used to... Um, when I first started conducting for movies, and the, the first movie I conducted was, I think, uh, I pretty said it was The Peacemaker in 97. Wow, okay. Uh, and I'd co-written that with, with Hans. He, he was wow. uh, coming in in his, at the time, not everybody had their own setup, so um, he didn't have like double setups at the, that point. Okay. Now he's got like a team of people to help him. But at the time, he had one room where he was working, and uh, he would work during the day. And at the night, I would come in and do my work, and then he'd critique it, critique <laughs> it. Came in. So I, I'd written a fair amount of that movie with him, and so he said, "Well, you better conduct it." And that was the first thing I conducted for Hollywood, and that was incredibly nerve wracking. Um, and well, how come? It, like, why is because, it? Is it the budget? Because I didn't really know what I needed to do for the job. You think <laughs> I'm a conductor, so I, I've got to control everything. I've I've got to tell everyone what to do, like the director in a movie. Yeah. But then you think about it. Even uh, a director in a movie doesn't actually do the acting; they only influence it. Yes. So one, it took me about five. T- more than five years to realize that my job as a conductor wasn't to play all the instruments because you, you can't possibly do that. Yeah. But to make the atmosphere for the musicians conducive for them to do their best work. And what, what that means is actually you've got to be the most relaxed person in the room. Hmm. You have, a, when everyone's saying, Oh, we've only got five minutes left. We've got a four minute queue left. You know, we've, we've got to get it on this take. You have to remain absolutely calm and just treat it like um, just going for a walk. There's, there's nothing <laughs> crazy going on, questions flying in from all directions. You know, and also as the conductor, you, you may have people, the, um, people from the orchestra asking you questions. You've got your headphones on, you've got uh, the, the composer telling you to do things, uh, the engineer asking. You know, you've got three or four layers of questions going yeah. on. Anyway. yeah. Uh, and at first, I I, I, tr- I had difficulty in dealing with that, but 
you know, after 10 years or so, you kind of calm down. And like a lot of things in life, just being relaxed is a good way of getting things done. And the people around you respond to that. Yes. I, and my dad always told me um, that the best leaders are, are going to be calm. You, you can't follow a leader if he's going to be erratic and stressed out because then he'll just stress you out. Exactly. Yeah. And you make more mistakes that way. Yeah. So um, I found that my sessions now on the solo were, were pretty chilled, pretty chilled. Huh. And, and it was great because um, – uh, you're talking about technology, most movies, I say most, I don't know precisely, but most movies today are recorded to a click. Really? The, you know, as, as in your, your, your sequence, so put out a click. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a number of reasons for that. It's, it's great for overdubbing parts. Um, it keeps everything in check. It's great uh, for keeping the tempo absolutely locked. Editors like that, you know, it's, um, it's not going to be shifting around too much. It's also um, one of the practices that a lot of people do is we will record the strings in one session and the brass in another session. Okay. Uh, and the reason isn't, isn't that they can't play it is it's because I'm going to use hands as an example. You know, he has the brass playing these huge chords and tw you know, 12 horns playing. <laughs> if they did play that at the same time as the strings, they'd wash out the sound from the strings. So the only way to make it work yes. is to record them separately. Right. And if you don't have a click, you never I really, gotcha. never really I gotcha. looks it. I mean, did um, they ever not record it with a click, though, in the past? Oh, yeah, yeah. Way, old school, way back when. So and, you'd get a mixing of strings and horns, and that wouldn't always be good. Well, it, it would be what it was. And, and, and one of the things I kind of miss in that old school thing is that, in a way, it does sound better because everything's huh. happening. The room is acting as one room all at once. Yeah. But on solo, we did quite a lot of recording all together. And we also did a fair amount of recording without the click, which is great fun. So we'd rehearse with the click, do a couple of takes with the click, and then John would say, right, okay, we'll turn the click off now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then that's when it gets fun because you can push and pull just a little bit, but yeah. it, it takes it away from being so regimented. Well, I um, mean, it's kind of like you're not fully the conductor, right, if you've got the click. Because it, exactly. it's conducting you, whereas yeah, little, if yeah. you're feeling if you're feeling something, you can't fully go there as the conductor. If you've got something else leading you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Exactly. Okay, uh, so, and go ahead. Have learned to play with the click to, to play musically, but it, it's not a natural thing. The first I time you do, it. I got very you. disconcerting. Um, so going back to um, Hans Zimmer, and I guess just. I have a question here that is basically I want to hear you to rattle off your top three um, <laughs> most favorite composers to work with, um, just sort of going down the line. Okay. Uh, in no particular order, um, I'm going to say, um, and I hope no one would be offended if they're missed off because I've worked with some fantastic people. <laughs> um, uh, I... Um, uh, I... John Powell is probably my favorite to work with. Okay. Uh, just because he is always challenging the orchestra and you to, you know. Um, and for those of the audience members who don't know, can you list off some movies that Powell's done? Okay, so all the, the Bourne series. Okay. Um, uh, How to Train Your Dragon. Okay. Uh, lot, quite a lot of animation, actually. Um, uh Chicken Run. He worked with uh, Harry Gregson Williams on that, and yeah, huge movies, huge movies. Wow. Uh, uh, let me see. There's uh, lots more of Solo, obviously. Okay. Yep. Uh, um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. He's got he's got a range, and you know, it's just kind of like cookie stuff as well. Okay. Um, and the Italian Job. He did the Italian Job remake. Man, that's um, crazy. He's uh, loads, loads of stuff. Right. Um, and so I interrupted you. I'm sorry. What were you? Uh, that's okay. Um, um, and then um, uh, obviously Hans is just uh, incredibly inspiring. Yes. Uh, and working with him on, I didn't work uh, writing the score, but I, I, I certainly uh, was there for the recording of um, Interstellar, which was 
monumental. Um, <laughs> that soundtrack is, is incredible. It's, it's, it is. It takes your breath away. I mean, to be able to write a soundtrack that yeah. reflects interdimensional space travel <laughs> is a big yeah. deal. And he did it. He did it. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, we recorded the string uh, orchestra in a place called Temple Church in in London, um, which was the same place that <clears throat> that we recorded the the organ as well. Yeah, it's got this incredible long five or six second reverb, uh, <clears throat> and I think that that sort of added to the the, the to, is that word, it's a word dimensionality of it. It just yeah. sort of get, gave it. Oh, a that level. was a natural reverb. It wasn't post or oh, edited no, that, in. Yeah, that was the reverb of of the space. That is so uh, wild to me that, I mean, there's a there is a purity to, to both your music and his music that it's like, it's unwavering in its honesty. Um, yeah, there, there's not yeah. It, from what from what it sounds like, it's like he'd rather spend the money and the time and the risk of finding this church and working in it rather than just saying, Hey, let's just put it in afterwards, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he, he's, he's, he really is an artist. If, if something, if he spent you know, a lot of money on something to, uh, and it doesn't work, throws it out. It, it, it doesn't matter. Right. It's about the art. I remember a story once, um, when, um, they were approaching a deadline on the movie and, uh, he uh, there was a cue that uh, finally the director said, "Yeah, that 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 that's working. That's, that's working for me." And and you got to remember the deadline is really tight, and they've got to move on and, and and get recording very soon. And Hans turned around to him and said, "Yeah, I'm not happy." <laughs> and threw it out, threw his own cue out. Oh my goodness! Um, wow. Uh, uh, and redid it in a day, or or you know, just just. So I know what I need to do now. Yeah, I've, scrambled I've, yeah. and got it done. Yeah. Um, do you feel that way as well with your music, where if it's not right, if you don't feel good about it, you're not going to share it with the world? Or are you willing to release stuff that you're not okay with? Yeah, I mean, that was the thing with the second album. It, it, it's true. It gets, it gets harder to present stuff uh, of a certain... Uh, uh, you know, when it's really, you're really sort of bearing your soul, which the piano music is. You know, there's yes. no way to hide. It's just me. Um, and the second one took a l it didn't take longer to write. Uh, I write if, if I'm in, in the writing mode, I'll, you know, I'll write and finish and notate one piano piece a week, which is not fast. But I like to. Um, yeah, I mean, the like quality to... of these pieces, man, like I, I honestly the way that I listen to that album is I'm thinking he must have been writing this his whole life because it, there really is so much emotion in that second album and i don't want to discredit the first um, no, no, no. but the second I, the second album something special about that album and i i'd really love to um figure out like you said it was sorry to jump around in this conversation yeah, i know i'm all over the place I'm just yeah. really i really am i wanted to touch on the, the composers but honestly i yeah. really do want to talk about and do, what's the name of the album to you could share it with well, the, the audience Called woven. 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 And the and the idea is um, one of the ideas I wanted to do was to see if I could tell a story, like in the movie. So you have a movie, it tells the story, and then music accompanies it. Right. But can you take someone on a journey, a proper beginning to end, over the length of an album, and at the end of it, then feel like they've actually travelled? Yes. Um, and so that was that was in the back of my mind on everything I was writing, all of it that I was writing. Um, and that so, explains the last song, isn't it? Called "We Traveled Far." It's "We Traveled Far," and then "Good Night, My Love." So that's like yes. time, time to bed. Gotcha. Um, oh, cool. Uh, the titles didn't. I had the the I knew what the songs were about, but I didn't necessarily have the titles until quite late. That's incredible. And I didn't want to make. I didn't want to make the titles tell you exactly what 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 to think yeah there is there is an emotional strand that i follow when i listen to that album and mm. i the titles really do help me um for example um the the song um and then i saw you it wh who is that about or if you don't mind me asking uh it's uh well i i will never divulge exactly what anything any of them <laughs> well, the stay mysterious 
I don't want to um, diminish your own reaction and response, uh, response to it because it's a personal thing. So there's, there's a person, I'm actually telling a very, very personal story, uh, which no one knows what it is. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's, it's semi-fictional and, and, and semi, semi not. Yeah. Uh, but let, let's just say it tracks pretty much any relationship that will happen in, right. in, in respects of, you know, there's good times, there's bad times. There's, yeah. uh, times when, uh, you know, things are great and then there's obviously yeah. trapping um well that's what's really special i think about this album and i encourage anyone listening to this podcast or interview to mm. to just listen to the album in a quiet place and and reflect and i'm getting chills i don't it's it's such a special album i'm not just trying to flatter you gavin it's really special to me well, um I, and this... for me like for me like what I what happened to me, and this is sort of uh, a little bit. You got my email, but yeah. part of the reason why Gavin and I, um, and this is for my audience, part of the reason why my you and I are talking right now is because I just had to email you and tell you about my experience listening to your music. I, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, but I was listening to, and then I saw you, and I was thinking about the first time I saw my daughter. Cause she mm. was she was born mm. in uh, January of 2018, mm. and I remember I I listened to that song and I had to get up out of I was listening to it in bed on my iPhone. I had to get out what? of bed and go cry in the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> because of how impactful that mm. song was. It connects to some kind of, and I love the title because it connects with an emotion that says something happened when I saw yeah. you something yeah. clicked and I'm different and uh that yeah. I don't know what what it is it's almost like a it's like a melody a melody can communicate an emotion and that is to me one of the most bizarre spiritual it's got to be spiritual of some to some degree like that the you, the notes that you chose to play and they're very that song is very simplistic very um, simple but those notes are it's it's one of the most complicated ideas that those whatever five to ten simple notes of that melody mm. Mm. repeating can somehow cause you to think of the most profound and eternal emotion. It's bizarre to me. I don't know how don't you know. pulled that off. I don't know how it works. All I can say is that it music can do that and. Obviously, not everyone has the same reaction to a piece of music. Yeah. But I, I had a similar reaction to a piece by uh, Richard Strauss the other day, a piece called Metamorphosen. Okay. Well, it's um, in the version for seven string players. And I, I'd heard a recording um, on Spotify, and I thought, mm, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's okay. It's, you know, it's late romantic. Um, mm. it, it's, it's, uh, it was written in response to uh, events in the Second World War. Wow. But I went to a performance of it. And by the end of it, I <laughs> just, you know, I was a one big soggy mess. I yes. Mean, it, <laughs> <laughs> so the live performance of it, some something was special about that compared to the actual yeah. recording of it. Yeah. Wow. That's. And it's hard. I think it's very hard to capture that in recording. Um, and I tried really hard with 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 the recording of of Woven, not to make it perfect, not to fix. Obviously, things that are important to me, like playing the right notes, that's important to yeah. me. I think timing and to, to maintain um, the shape the shape and dynamic and not do everything to a click. Well, I think that was a really, really wise decision because there, there it almost sounds like you're playing the piano in the middle of like a field or the woods. Like there's mm. that natural – it's almost um, – I don't know if you know what ASM, ASMR is, um, but or the trend of it. Yeah, yeah, and that's how it is. It's very gritty, and you can hear every little tiny thing. Um, yeah. Very delicate is what I the best word that I can think of. And for me, like that delicacy and perhaps um, imperfection of it. I wouldn't call it. That's the best word I, I can think of. Mm. But mm. that imperfection of it, that delicacy of it, is what makes it special. Because when I listen to your previous album, I, again, I don't want to 
mm. say anything bad about it. It's just that for some reason, the second album, because it's so delicate, because it's so um, it's stream of consciousness, that's how it feels. Mm. It, it made it stand out like 3,000 times more than your previous I, album. I think the performances are much better as well because I didn't struggle so much. Having practiced the piano, yeah. I could actually I could actually play it in real time the way I wanted to play it. Is it hard to play the piano in good time and with proper form when you're playing delicately, or are you playing delicately in your second um, album? I, I am playing delicately, uh, although I'm helped by the the felt. Yeah, um, so I was going to ask about that. What is that? Well, that was that was the the thing that kind of set me off really down this path of doing something really, really quiet. Um, and I, I, I was practicing, well, I wasn't practicing, I was composing a piece for what I thought would be the second album. And it was quite a big crash bang wallop uh, piece of music. Um, and I, my ears were going, this is just loud. You can't <laughs> keep up for hour after hour. Give me a break. Yeah. Uh, and then I remembered that uh, a lot of pianos, upright pianos, have a thing called a practice pedal. And it's not the pedal that's interesting. It's the fact that it puts um, a layer of felt, brings it down in between the strings and the hammers. So the hammers okay. hit the felt and then they then they hit the strings. Right. And that, and the, it, it is, it's usually sort of a bit of material, not too thick on, on a normal piano. So I went up to the loft and I happened to have this roll of black felt cut some felt and just hung it over the keys and, and cut the, the relevant spaces for the, the you know, the, um, uh, the uh, frame of the piano. Yeah. And I started playing and for, for immediately it's much, much quieter, of course. Yeah. But also it, it's, it distorts the sound slightly. Uh, and it, well, you might play one note, but actually you're slightly hitting the note either side of it as well. Yeah. Just a little bit. Not enough to make it sound wrong, but it just gives it this vibe. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I just totally thought this is brilliant. I, you know, maybe I could, <laughs> I could do an EP of, of of you know felt piano, and then it just grew and grew. Um, uh, and of course, later on, I realised that lots of people have done felt piano. Well, I is, I found that I a lot of that. a lot of younger type. I don't know what the word is, not younger. Um, I guess millennial, trendy, mm. hipster piano music. Um, one of the bands is called um, Goldmund. They oh. they do something very similar, and it's they, they've they been contracted by, like, Apple and stuff, I think. I could be wrong, for, like, their commercials and stuff. Really moody mm. music, but I don't know if they did the felt technique. Like, and I, right. dude, I've tried to... I've, I've tried to replicate this in my most recent game with mm. uh, it's called once upon a coma. Cool. Um, we're, we're launching yeah. on Nintendo in this ah. summer and the way that I, I do all software instruments. I, I don't record a live piano. So I just open up logic pro and play the piano. And then yeah. what I do is I just decrease the volume <laughs> of the keys as much as I can to get that yeah. soft sound, it's but you soft, really yeah. can't, you really can't replicate what you've done because it's it's not really felt it's just decreasing the volume um so you've never heard of anyone else really doing the felt technique exactly the way you're doing it well i hadn't until after i'd finished and then um i, I, I don't know, you must you must have heard of niels from um he he did a yes. whole album actually called felt and uh, having realized this i went oh no this is a disaster I'm just gonna <laughs> but then i listened to his album and it's a very 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 different vibe yeah it, yeah it's um totally different and the thing that i did that I, I i'm most proud of is that instead of then adding other sounds to this felt piano i made i added other piano sounds yeah like i would pluck with a, a plectrum or um hold my fingers on the strings while while playing the the keys yeah you get like, dunk, 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 yeah dunk, there, dunk. that happens a lot in that album where i'm like what is what is that instrument and it's all a piano all Every of, sound. There's some sense. sounds that even sound synth. I don't know what that is, um, but there, that's. There's one. Um, is it in is the it sun rose? Like, um, something in the middle of the sun rose is. Uh, it sounds. It sounds like electric. Yeah, that's um, felt earplugs. 
put in um, <laughs> into, into the top of the strings. Yeah. And it dampens it. You still get the pitch, but it dampens it. It's almost like a, a, a moog sound, isn't it? Um, that's uh, that's the only time that, that I did any sort of real processing was there's a sound in We Traveled Far. Um, it goes like whoa, 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 whoa. And that's a chord on the piano sent through uh, a Moog filter with LFO. Okay, okay. I just wanted to sort of at that point just stretch the palette a bit and make you think, oh, yeah, we, we've gone right. a bit further than, than yeah. someone on the piano now. Did you do any, uh, what's the right word, post-production mm. or editing in, regarding the recordings? Like I did hear some ambient sort of re reverby stuff in the background of a lot of the so yeah. the slower songs, and I'm wondering if yeah, that's I just an effect you're using you know, there, there's there's a lot of reverb on it uh, post-production reverb okay okay um, if for some reason uh the, it's quite hard to find reverbs that work well on piano um it can get really I've, muddy in my experience yeah, it can get really muddy very muddy but bizarrely with the felt piano at least my felt piano um, I, I found that a long reverb, um, and um, I've been using the uh, reverbs by Stephen Slate uh, from, from the, his plugins. Um, actually, I think the uh, it's a Liquid Sonics, I think, made, made the engine for it. Um, and my, my favorite ones are, are the Bricasti uh, impulses. Okay. Five, six seconds long. And uh, nice. they seem to bring this space with, without taking over um so i use a lot of that on, on it and, and there's some backwards piano where i've played it and put it backwards as well so did you you handled the recording and the mixing and the mastering of it all uh the i my very good friend nick woolwich who's a super engineer who he uh recorded all the house train your dragons and solo and He's worked with all sorts of people, actually. Yeah. Uh, he came over for a day and set up, we set up eight mics on the piano. Wow. And you think, crazy, why so many mics? <laughs> I had a couple of old ribbon mics uh, just above it, some very, very uh, clean, um, you know, small diaphragm mics, a couple of mics at the back of the piano, and then some nice Neumanns a bit further away in the room. And then by varying the mix of, of those, you can you can get a, a more you know cleaner sound or something a bit a yeah. bit more depth. <clears throat> uh, but he came and set that up, and then basically I was left to my own devices, uh, which is great because that's how you for me I, I I think you probably feel the same. You know when you're working on a project, until quite late on, you don't really want too much help. Yep. Because it's going to dilute it or take you away. Maybe you you haven't explored without. Well, in my experience, whether it's with writing soundtracks for games, and I've done three games, um, so I've got like three different soundtracks, um, mm. or the artwork for, for games. In my mm. experience, I don't know what it is, what the game is, what the soundtrack is, until like the 11th hour. Like right yeah. now, I have, I have uh, two weeks until I have to finish Once Upon a Coma per my contract with my publisher. Uh-huh. And... I finally know what the game is. Like right. I finally know what the, and it's I it's I know that's a really abstract way of saying it, but like, it's become a person finally. It's like a yeah. thing that I know, and I I could explain its personality to anyone on the street. I could finally explain it, and so Until I don't want to be interrupted in the discovery process of that. Like cause yeah. I, I don't want to tell, and I don't even want to tell people what I think it is. You know, until it's there. Yeah. yeah, I got to the point with, with Woven where I had, I don't know, 14, 15 pieces and I was actually stuck. I didn't really know how I was going to put it all together. Yeah. You know, I knew what I wanted to do. but I, And the, the turning point was we we're on the, the tour bus uh, uh, for World of Hans Zimmer and um, we we're all sharing things we've been working on yeah. among, amongst the band. And uh, Juan Garcia Herreros, who's the, the bass player, it's fabulous bass player from Colombia. Um, he played me some of this Latin uh, music he'd, he'd been working you know, Some of it was like Bach rearranged or some of it was in, in his own compositions. And it was stunningly good. Yeah. And he said, so what have you been working on? And I was like, mm -hmm. 
or maybe <laughs> I, and I played him uh, a beginning the, the first track yeah. from the album. Well, yeah. that's that's pretty safe. And uh, at that point, I hadn't actually sequenced the album in terms of which went where. I, right. I, I, was, I was still in flux with the story, and I didn't have a title for that one. And I said, "Well, I, I don't know. I don't have a title for this one. I, you know, it's, it's just a beginning." <laughs> and I thought, oh, Oh, it's a beginning. All right. So, yeah. And and he heard it and he said, okay, play me more. And yeah. uh, then I spent the rest of the the next the next journey on the bus. I thought, right, I'm going to title this now. I'm, every song is now going to get its title. And now I'm yeah. ready to do this. Yeah. And I sat and I and I just meditated in, inwardly and, and searched for words, and I found every title. Um, Actually, apart from one, which was Autumn Came So Soon, because I didn't have that song at that point. Oh, man. I'm, I'm looking at the titles right now, and I'm not kidding, Gavin. Like, when I think about this album, I think about I – can, I can remember the name. See, the, uh, I have a terrible memory, and when mm-hmm. I listen to a lot of – especially classical music, when you're listening to Bach or Chopin or something, you can't remember any of those names, if you're me, because – yeah. They're so complicated <laughs> yeah. um, and technical. But yeah. looking at these titles, A Beginning, The Sun Rose, and then I Saw You, A Conversation, We Danced for Seven. Um, Autumn, I love the title Autumn Came So, came so Soon. I, I love that title because every time Autumn comes, that's what I think. Yeah. It's like it, it happened oh. so fast. Oh, so where, did, where did the time go? Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah. and after that, you see that that if you have the um, the vinyl, and for me, it's very important to make a vinyl on this. Oh. If you have the vinyl, that's where the side turns over. Um, and in terms of concept album, yeah, it's so a seasonal me, like, thing, right? It it changes yeah. seasons as you play it. Yeah, it's changed. So, uh, but the, in terms of just going back to the titling, um, I didn't settle on the title until. It actually made me cry each each time. Like I'd have a title and go, hmm, no, it's not. It's not <laughs> and and I was it would make me cry because it would it would be so perfect for yeah. the music. Yeah. So I, mean, I sound like a, a I'm a wreck uh, emotionally, but I'm not. It's it's just that's part of the process that you if you don't feel it. I, I think, think I think most artists don't know, or a lot of artists and musicians don't know how to sense that. I mean, they could be the most technically proficient music, musician in the world, but mm. they can't sense when the song says something and they hear it, yeah. and it it's saying some emotional thing, and you're, yeah. you you can he, your heart can hear what the song is saying, yeah. <clears throat> or at least maybe what the majority of people listening to your music would think it's saying, and it, I, exactly. I think you do that. I think you really pulled it off with the titling. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, nice. So when you were, did you do any ping pong balls? I watched your videos on your YouTube channel. Did you do any ping pong balls with this album? Well, the thing is, the thing about an upright piano uh, is you, you can't because the, the strings go that way and gravity goes that way. Oh, this way. is all an upright piano? <laughs> it was, yeah, all an upright piano. Okay, why did you uh, choose I, an upright over a grand? Um, well, initially, I didn't think you could put a felt... Uh, on, a, on a grand piano because these the the hammers if, if that's the strings the hammers are underneath yeah and you know that you've got access to this part but the hammers come up like this you, you can't put felt in i got you uh, but i've since been doing concerts and with my son we worked <laughs> out a way of feeding through a, like a um a, what is it? you know if you're if you're wrapping something up to, to send it in a parcel and it's like a yeah you know quarter of an inch wide and it's plastic mesh sort of thing and it's, so i'd feed a little bit of this th- th- under the strings <laughs> and then once, once you try to use use little uh, tools to, to pull it through and then it, when you get it all the way to the end you then tape on a bit of felt and pull it all the way through so anyway i've worked out now you can do it with a grand piano that's awesome um, so maybe that's uh, something for the future well um, honestly for me i prefer the sound of an upright I think it 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 feel it sounds I don't know if cheaper is the right word but it just sounds more homey I think and less less um big. <laughs> what did you to think that you were sitting next to me while I was playing it and I think the the the, the upright is great for that. It's just yeah. like 
little story to someone. Come on, come, on, come sit next to me. I'm going to play the piano to you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, Spider Man. Let's talk about Spider Man really quick. So you were mm-hmm. one of the. Um... Just I, on that, I was just a, a conductor. Okay. Um, so uh, it, the other thing huh, you don't know about me is that talking about memory, you say you're remembering titles. I've worked on well over 100 movies and games as a conductor now and, and orchestrator probably, I don't know, 20 or 30. I don't remember <laughs> half the things I've done. <laughs> um, someone said to me the other day, oh, yes, because, you know, when you, you conducted Pearl Harbor, didn't you? And I went, well, I remember writing a cue on Pearl Harbor, but I definitely <laughs> didn't conduct it. Do they have multiple conductors for movies, or do they just uh, hire one conductor? Usually, it's, it's, it's depending on, on, on schedule. Usually, it's just one. Um, anyway, I did conduct Pearl Harbor. I'd just completely forgotten. So you, you like, th- to me, that's crazy. You conducted the entire score for Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And you're having trouble remembering that. No recollection of it. <laughs> um, so you talk about Spider-Man. How did uh, one one thing I, I do know about the games, which which is really fascinating now, and, and I, I, I um I I think it's the great use of technology is the um I don't know who's I think each company has their own engine, as it were, for the music. <clears throat> but <clears throat> excuse me, um, talking about using the click. To advantage, we often record um, uh, a layer, well, like a string layer, and that's got a particular sound to it. Yeah. And then um, uh, a brass layer, or a woodwind layer, or a different percussive layer, uh, and then a variation on those layers. So they they can all work layered up on each other. Right. You can you know different permutations of them. And these, these engines in the gameplay will switch seamlessly yeah. to to re almost reorchestrate it. Yeah, depending on uh, what the the player is doing. Depending on the player, so it's always you know growing. Now that's great that's crazy. when you're playing the game, but it's a nightmare when you're recording. <laughs> <laughs> that's really great that you bring that up, man, because uh, it's kind of industry standard, especially for AAA games to. Yeah to have that growing soundtrack and changing soundtrack with the melody is the same, but it's just becoming more intense. So how, how on earth do you, do you direct that? Like, yeah, well we, we have to, I mean, it's, it's a little bit trial and error, to be honest. Um, a lot of the trial and error has already been done with the samples. If it works with the samples, you know, the composer has been through and, um, they already know all these these parts are going to work together. Yeah. But then when you come to play it, and remember, this is this is musicians, and they're 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 human. They don't necessarily play in the same tuning sense by themselves as they would when they were playing uh, all together in an orchestra. And we do sometimes run into uh, um, problems where we have to go back and having re having recorded. Um, the strings on on a section. Then we in the evening maybe we record the brass, and then the, then we realise that the strings are actually a bit out of tune because we've done it separately. Yeah. And this oh tune man. Has to work across the whole, all the layers. Yeah. Um, well, do do you uh, usually have to tune to a like a a tuner, like a digital tuner or something? Most of the time, we, we um, Pro Tools we use Pro Tools to put out a, a, a standard A440 and tune yeah. to that. Yeah. So um, how did that get out of tune then? It's it's just people. Um, you yeah. know, sometimes you kind of forget, and as as the temperature of the room goes up or down, the, the pitch changes. Um, the, I can get really really esoteric on this. Um, Please do. If <laughs> see, let's, let's pick it up. Let's say C sharp. Okay. Now, if if you look at your piano keyboard, there's one C sharp, isn't it? That's that is C sharp. Yeah. If you're a horn player, a French horn player, and you're playing in, in this three of you playing, you're playing A, C sharp, B, so that makes an A major triad. That C sharp that you play in the middle is slightly flat to what it would be on the piano. 
Oh wow! So it's like in between to and, a and half it, step. It's it's tight. It's it's, a, it's like ten ten fifteen. <laughs> the reason being is that the harmonic series doesn't quite fit in the in our our twelve uh, equal temperament scale. Wow! But a good musician will just tune each just a little bit to make it more harmonious. Wow. Now that's great. That that's so when you hear that A major chord by the you know, the the real guys, it just sounds right, strong, and good. But if you're playing a tune and you don't know that that you're playing against that A, a major chord, and you don't hear it, and you will play a C sharp without realizing that you're in the key, the key that, say A major. Yeah. That C sharp won't match with the horns. Wow. And, and that's something maybe you couldn't foresee. It'll be sufficiently out tune that you won't like it. Um, so how do you solve that? You have to make sure that when you're recording, and this is this is a bane of all our lives as recording musicians, <laughs> you're listening through headphones yeah. on whatever's been recorded as a reference. Right. If you're doing this, this layering thing, which we do a lot with the games. Um, and the problem there is that, uh, believe it or not, the, the, your sense of pitch changes um, when you're listening through headphones than if you're listening in the room. Wow. So you kind of learn, and it's a, it's it's very hard to describe, but it becomes kind of a feel thing. You okay. just feel when it's in tune. Yeah. Um, even though technically you would say, oh, I can hear, that's definitely flat or that's definitely sharp. I've done it to musicians. I've said, "Oh, uh, trumpets, you're you're playing flat on that note," and then I'll hear uh, the um, engineer come through the headphones and say, "Actually, I think it's sharp." <laughs> and we'll go and listen in the in the in the control room. Yeah. And wow, it, it is sharp, but in the room, it, it sounds feels flat. flat. To me. That's wild. Um, and it, yeah. So <laughs> I think I think uh, maybe some viewers might, and I myself included. Mm. I might be confused when I think about where you are when you're working. Are you in a studio? Mm. Are you on a stage? Like, are you in a, one room with one person? And are you conducting that one individual? How's it work? Right. Okay, so um, I've, I've conducted anything from a small section of half a dozen players up to 110. Yeah. We tend to record... a. You, I, I'm very lucky. I, I get to work with high-end people, and they have big budgets mostly. So we work with fairly large orchestras. Yeah, it's not uncommon to have something like uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 string players. In the, so you might have six double basses, eight cellos, twenty odd violins. Wow. Um, and uh, uh, have a, a woodwind section, maybe uh, three flutes couple of oboes and an English horn, a uh, couple of clarinets and a bass clarinet, a couple of bassoons. So you could have maybe 10 wind players. Horns with these big scores, often it's six horns. Yeah. Four trombones, six trombones, sometimes eight trombones in a tuba. Then you've got the percussion section. Now, percussions are, uh, 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 that's really changed the way we record percussion. Because you know these, the, as you know from the samples, you can make the most amazing produced samples, which no human can play. Right, right. So we often have layers of of even on on the highest end games, there's lots of sample percussion. Yeah, just to, yeah. I found that like percussion is nice to be able to control in post because it yeah. might it, it's hard maybe it's hard to control the pitch of it. I don't know if that's something yeah. you want to be able to control. Because like yeah. sometimes when I hear some percussion, it sounds like it, it wasn't tuned or something to yeah. to work with it. So you want you want control over it. So we we almost always record that separately. Okay. Um, and that's uh, like uh, cymbal, cymbal rolls and yeah um, bass drums. So sometimes where, you're only conducting like six people. Rarely. I mean, at that point, they they're sort of self organizing, and and it's a bit expensive having one person for six. So. Mostly, I'm about I see. forty to uh, and up, wow. forty uh, up. Um, and the the rooms we record in in London uh, are uh, Abbey Road Studios, obviously famous Abbey Road Studios. 
which was um, yeah. always fun. And uh, Air Lindhurst, um, which is one of Hans's favourites, actually. Uh, he works a lot there. Uh, Lorn also uh, works a lot at Air Lindhurst. Um, and they're, um, this is quite sad, uh, they're the only two rooms now in London where you could get a 90-piece orchestra in and record it all together. Wow. The other rooms closed uh, due to, um, you know, not enough work in the in the past. Um, so you you recorded. I'm trying to follow. So you recorded in Abbey Road. Mm. Sixty people. Is that what you're saying? Oh, 80, 90, up to yeah. Okay, yeah. so what? That brings me to Paul McCartney. Um, <laughs> yeah. What was what was that project you worked on with him? That that was the the funniest thing. Um, we were recording the um, the Dark Knight. That was, is that the, was that the first of the, the Batman trilogy? I think it was. Well, the Batman Begins, then Dark Knight. Oh, and Batman then... Begins. No, it was Batman Begins. That's right. Um, and uh, James Stewart and Howard and Hans Zimmer working together. So we're working at uh, Air Lindhurst, which is a converted church. Okay. So that we work on the floor, and sometimes you put a choir up in the balcony, but the balcony is just usually empty. So after the session, I get a call from someone who says, you know, hello, I'm, this is Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then after a minute, I go, oh, I think this might actually be Paul McCartney. Um, he said, well, I'd like, I've written this requiem for, for Linda. It's called Eke Cormeo. And um, w- would, you, w- would you conduct it for me? Wow, and and I said, well, I think you've got the wrong person because <laughs> I'm not really, you know, you want a classical conductor, you know, you want like Simon Rattle. Wait, what's or, Linda? I'm so sorry. What is Linda? Li- Linda his, was his first wife. Okay, okay. Uh, and this is we're talking night 2004, so she died just a few years previous oh, okay. to that. Okay, I feel like um, I should know that, but I'm not a huge yeah. Beatles fan, yeah. weirdly, but. <laughs> But yeah, so um, I said, I, I, I don't think you've got the right person. And I tried to talk him out of it. He said, no, I, I like the way you talk to the orchestra. Huh. Interesting. Like you were saying before about, you know, connecting with yeah, the orchestra. Yeah, you, you connected with them on a personal level orchestra. maybe? or. So we recorded the, the um, in fact, we recorded a demo of it. This is the most amazing thing. He had the budget where we recorded a demo with the orchestra that we finally recorded the final recording with, 60-piece orchestra, uh, choir, soloists at Abbey Road. And then a few months later, after he made some changes and you know, rethought it, recorded it again. Wow. Uh, and then he said, right, okay, so premiere Royal Albert Hall, whenever it was. Uh, and at that point, and... Uh, He's, he probably realised, but I had never done a live concert before. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, there's no way I'm not going to do this. But maybe I ought to take a couple of conducting lessons. <laughs> uh, which? How, wait, wait. How old? This was in 2000 when? In 2006. So I'd been conducting professionally for 10 years. Yeah, and I, that's crazy. I hadn't had any lessons. Um, <laughs> ever. Uh, so I, I sought out a, a conducting teacher who gave me three lessons, and actually, I learned an awful lot uh, about technique from him just yeah. in those three lessons. Wow. Uh, and I've been back to him since and, and learned even more. So, but that, that was my first live with an orchestra c- concert, was at the Royal Albert Hall. Was this filmed? It was filmed. Um, it's. Um, it's out on, I don't know, DVD or streaming. Um, and you got to be a part of that. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, and now, obviously, I've done a lot of concerts since, but that was the one that where, as I was talking earlier about staying calm, I, I had no option but to stay calm because yes. Yes. really I was so far out of my depth. Um, well, obviously it, not, you know, because it worked well, out. You knew what you were doing. Yeah. <laughs> but it was so scary, and I just had to keep um, keep calm and just do the thing. You know, the, I practiced it. Yeah, yeah. And the orchestra with me, and off we went. And and there were a couple of moments in in the performance where 
it got really exciting because I thought, oh, hang on a minute, it's just like driving a really fast car. <laughs> Free from the click and with an audience because you, you, know, you get such a kick with an audience. Yeah. You start to really create music and, and do stuff that you didn't think was possible with the orchestra yeah. before that. Yeah. Um, so what was it like working with Paul McCartney? Great. Very. He's a very nice Did guy. Did you work yeah. very closely with him, like in the studio, writing with him? Not not writing, but he he would have he was working with um, a, a, a team that a producer from uh, EMI, um, John Fraser, who was advising on maybe changing the bits of orchestration or, yeah. or structures and things. It was all in place, but uh, I didn't really have much input, um, which I was quite pleased of actually. I didn't have much input <laughs> creatively. I just had to stick, do what I needed to do, um, and, and get that right. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, um, the final question I wanted to ask you, Gavin, is um, a lot of my audience is probably interested in getting into this kind of music industry, whether it's writing music for films or games yeah. or conducting, and mm. uh, a lot of them are considering school, going to university. <laughs> Um, and, and it's, you know, things have changed and especially in America, student debt is a really huge problem right now. Mm. Mm. And my question is, mm. maybe it's twofold. First, do you think that they should go to college if they want to step into this? And mm. second, if they can't afford it, what should they do? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I went to, um, the Trinity College of Music okay. and I studied piano and composition I didn't even, I, I was already dabbling with, with film and TV at that point. Um, okay. I did it because I wanted to broaden my knowledge and, and, and my abilities. Uh, and I think that's the only reason to really go to, <clears throat> to a conservatory is if you, if you want to really dig deep and, yeah. and get, get into your art. Now, um, I, I was, my my older son is 19 now and and he doesn't know whether he's going to do jazz and study that at a, a university or maybe even go to an art college and i said to him it doesn't really matter hmm. for me as long as you find one thing and really drill down into it study it in depth become yeah. a master of that thing that will then un enable you to do other things so now i'll start answering your question <clears throat> should you go to university to study film scoring. My feeling is that it can be useful in terms of your education. Okay. Doesn't really mean you're going to get a job at the end of it. Yeah. Meaning um, it, it doesn't necessarily form the right connections. No. And the business is very much about connections. Yes. yes. Uh, it, it's, it's probably as much used to seek out uh, other creators, hmm. other, other people who make films, right. or games, or um, <clears throat> just calling them up on Skype, maybe, and talking to them like we're talking now. Yeah, emailing. I I, I mentor about uh, any one time three or four people. Um, That's awesome. Are at um, conservatories or or not who are looking to find their way into the business in some form and and I'll, I'll advise them on what I think obviously it's, it's my personal take but what I never really advise you know if you want to write film scores for instance don't spend your time listening to film scores <laughs> why because so, say you're 20 and you want to write film scores you look at everyone in Hollywood you're lucky to make it before you're 40 really. wow wow so that's 20 years you got 20 years growth from here. Uh, wow, well, I never thought about that. Yeah. Years time. It's not going to be what we're listening to now. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's not. So don't get stuck in what, what people are doing now. Yeah. Listen to as broad a range as possible. Listen to Rachmaninoff. Listen to Morton Feldman. Listen to um, you know, some of this crazy... Um, <laughs> Chronic stuff that people are doing, you know, like with, you know, found sounds and, and yes, um, yes. filters, and uh, and listen to dance music. Just listen to all sorts of music. <laughs> I mean, there's really, it's really hard to predict, obviously, what it's going to be in 20 years, and yeah. that maybe maybe what you're saying is 
listen to what you enjoy listening to, right? Yeah, and also analyze it. Don't be afraid to analyze it. And, and yeah. why does it work? Why does this harmony work for me? Why does this rhythm excite me? And learn to hear it. I, I didn't study orchestration. I never studied orchestration. I learned it by listening. I'd listen to Beethoven and I'd have the score in front of me and I'd follow the viola part and I'd, I'd listen to see what the horns were doing. Right. And after a while, you, you train. The thing is, what, what you're training is your ear. You're huh. training to hear. Huh. It's all about hear because if you can hear it, then you can find it. You can reproduce it. Yeah. Um, and I know you said to me earlier, you, know, you, you were a little, uh, maybe not as confident as you could be about your composing because you haven't studied. Oh, I don't even know how to write a single composition. It's all but, just, it's guess and check in Logic Pro. Well, for... that's, but do you know what? That, that's, you'd be surprised at the number of top level composers <laughs> that do that. <laughs> to find, yeah, because yeah. It, it, it doesn't, as long as you find it, it doesn't really matter how you get to it. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, like I, I like to pride myself in thinking that I can connect emotionally with people with my music, um, and I think that is that is the most important thing as a composer. We've all heard to connect. music that is technically incredible, and you go, "Wow, I could never do that," but it leaves you cold. Yeah, yeah. And when I listened to your music, it, I definitely felt that there's it connected, and it it it, it hmm. told a story doesn't really matter whether you've studied to get to that. You, you, <laughs> yeah, and part, but part of me, Gavin, thinks that, like, it would go a lot faster, like, writing music. You know, like, it's like, okay, there, for me, like, I have to figure out emotionally why a harmony works. I have no technical understanding of why it works. But to mm. get there, it took, like, six tries. And I'm like, oh, there it is. When, in yeah. reality, if I was a technical, if, maybe if I went to university or something, I would go, okay, that's going to work right off the bat. I know that will work because it fe- that technical term causes mm. this feeling. So maybe it could uh, help, you know? The amount of trial and error that I've gone through in the, the years since I've been, you know, cause I've, I've always dabbled at writing. Even from the time I was five at the piano, you're just wow. playing things and things. So in, in 50 years, I've been, would you call it hunt and check or pick guess and check? And, guess and check, yeah. Guess and check. I've been doing that for 50 years, and after 50 years of it, your guesses get better. Yeah, that's, okay. That's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it sounds like university is, is if you really want to learn, then it's good. Thing is, is, is most of my friends went to college because they wanted a job. They didn't want to learn a thing. They just wanted mm. to get a job. Mm. And so... I don't know, like, so you're saying that the the, the fifty thousand dollars of student debt is worth it to learn. If if, if that's yeah, if that yeah. Um, it's it's everyone's different, and everyone's path is different. You know, there there are stories of people that have um, come from uh, all over the world, camped outside a famous composer's office in in L.A. And been given the job as an intern. Yeah, but I, that's I, you can't advise anyone to do that because <laughs> what's the chances of success? You know, one in a, in a million. Yeah, just because someone did that once, it's probably never going to work again. Do you think but the they, do you think the ease of the do you think the barriers of entry to get into any kind of scoring, whether it's because there's there's a ton of TV shows and films, way more than there used to be. Video games as well. So do you think yeah. it's getting easier and easier for aspiring composers and conductors to get jobs now, or is it getting harder? I think in terms of composers, it probably is getting easier. Because like you say, there are more opportunities. Yeah. When I started, the, the gatekeepers were very strong, and there, there were only a very limited number of ways in. Okay. Now, you know, you could... What's to stop anyone who wants to score movies... Going out with their iPhone, shooting a, a five-minute short, and and scoring it themselves for what you know, a few thousand dollars. You've got a system which is ten times more powerful than anything I had when I was doing TV in the, in the nineties. Right, right. And putting it on YouTube, sharing it with friends. If it's good, I do believe people stop, will take notice. Huh. 
Yeah. It might take a while. Yeah. So you, you need to create. If you want to be a creator, um, well, and you've proved it, you know, if, if you want to write uh, computer games, you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Have, doing is the thing. Yeah. Um, and that, that I, may be, especially for people who just can't afford college, that may be their next step. Graduate high school and just start yeah. making things. Start making or get a job anywhere in close, to, close, to, even vaguely close to, to where you want to be. You know. Yeah. Uh, I, my first job uh, was as an assistant engineer at the studio. Uh, I did it for nine months, but in that time, I made more cups of tea than than did anything else. <laughs> But I was in the room and I learned from people yeah. and people started to listen to me as the lowly tape op assistant when I would say quietly to the engineer, I think, you know, the sax is playing the wrong note. He should be playing. You know, <laughs> and they go, oh, hang on a minute. This, this kid's got ears. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you, you know, and that got me other links to other things and you know programming yeah. for other people and it, you have to put yourself in a position where you could be found um and, and get that job but i think now you, you if you want to be a composer and i say this to all, all my um mentees you have to write you just got to get on and do it yeah well did this is my last question and then i i'm sure you're ready to go to bed and I, i've got to go take care of my daughter um, mm. what, is there one person or one business connection that you made that changed everything for you? Cause you've, you've, you've shaken hands with the, the most famous composers of all time. Yeah. And I want to know, was there somebody who got you there or did, was it well, slowly really, making yeah. connections? Now the, here's the thing. So having said all that I've said about finding, you know, putting yourself in the right place and, and you'll be found. I had a huge, huge head start because uh, my father uh, was a professional songwriter. Yes, I heard about that. What, now, was, what was his name? Roger. Okay. Um, now, he uh, never wrote for picture or anything like that, but he encouraged me to, to write. He thought I might be you know, I'm good at writing for adverts and, and for TV. And he encouraged me in, in that direction. Hmm. Um, and he definitely opened some doors for me. There's no question of it. He got me into the studio to, to have an interview, to want to, you know, can, can I be an assistant? Yeah. Um, but once I got through that door, I was on my own. You know, I, I had to prove myself. Yeah. yeah. And he also got me some of my early you know, jobs where I would assist him on things or so I learned through him. Right. Right. Uh, which meant that when I went myself to try and get an agent, I had a, a, a better understanding of the business than I would have done. Yeah. And I yeah. made fewer mistakes, fewer mistakes when I started. Right. Um, than I would have done. And that certainly, it probably took a few years off the trajectory. Um, is it possible? Hand, Go ahead. I, I, sorry. Go ahead. I would say Hans took a load of years off the trajectory because he called up. Uh, I was I'd set up a, an office with John Powell in London. We were doing a, um, a production company called Independently Thinking Music, and we'd only been up and running for a year or so. And we got a call from Hans saying, "Well, there's you know there's work in LA if you're prepared to come and live out here." This was in ninety five, ninety six. And the eight years I spent in Los Angeles with Hans as my sort of uh, a mentor um, and, and champion, yeah, that made so many connections then. I uh, bet. Wow. Okay. That was it, you know. Well, um, this has been incredible, dude. Thank you so much for your time. This really Hans means a lot good. to me that you – you were willing to talk to me. I, I trust me. Yeah. I told I told uh, everyone I all of my friends that I was going to be talking to you because they know how excited I am about your music. Yeah. Um. So I really really appreciate it. It's <laughs> golden advice. Um. 
and that it's free of charge for all for me and my viewers and that that means yeah. a lot to me and i'm sure it means a lot to them as well is there anything else you want to say or anything oh, uh, <laughs> sorry about the email Bing. no that's okay <laughs> i guess that means you got to get back to work right uh, is it um, hans I've just, I've just lost your picture i'm going to get you back i'm taking i'm taking a, a kind of a mini uh, most of july off because i've been so busy for the last uh, few months that yeah. I, I need some family time now so um, that's my next plan good but uh yeah um let's talk again at some point and yeah i uh, love that all the best with the new game um appreciate and, it uh, i'm sure it'll be great and uh <laughs> look forward to seeing it and playing it all right well gavin i appreciate it man you take it easy you too all right bye <laughs>